So you can see uh, in light of this series that we began called All Things New, we're today looking at a new perspective. I want you to go ahead and grab your Bible. You can turn to uh, Philippians chapter 2. We'll be there uh, starting with verse 12 as you saw just then. The choir, I was just listening to that powerful anthem. Uh, That's actually straight out of Philippians 1. Maybe you know that. I think verses 3 through 8 or somewhere there. Uh, I, I was thinking, Paul, writing those words in prison, how could he, he could have never um, dreamed that it would be put to music like that and then sung uh, in here for us today. What a beautiful, beautiful way to, to just reflect on, on scripture and sing it back to the Lord. And we do praise God. I praise God for you as your pastor. Every time I think of you, my heart is filled with love for our church family And it's so good to be together today. Um, As Catherine has led us so well, I hope that you, uh, if you haven't brought cards, uh, you can still do so. Go buy some gift cards and and then uh, you can turn this card in on your way out over there. I guess leave it in the pew if you need to and we'll grab them. But um, I've enjoyed getting cards to our our first responders, our healthcare workers and others. And um, today we're going to be able to bless them yet again. Uh, this week, in fact, I was able to, to uh, do a little video that is here. The QR code takes them to a video from me, from us as a church family, to let them know how much we love them and praise God for them. We're a church that is here for the city, and especially for those who are heroes among us, who, are, are, uh, who uh, again, Catherine noted, don't, aren't often thanked and appreciated as they should be. We praise God for our Our law enforcement officers, praise God for those who are first responders. We all need a little encouragement in these days. And today, what I want to do is just that, bring a new perspective. Remind you, those of us who are followers of Jesus, that we have a new perspective. This past summer, I was able to go to a place that really is special to us as a family. Some of you know that for some 20 plus years, our family has been going to a place called Wind River Ranch. It's become a place that has really been life-changing for us as a family. My kids have basically grown up going there for a week out of the summer, right when it gets so hot here in Dallas, you can hardly bear it. So in late July, um, I'm the, the camp or the ranch pastor, preacher, speaker that week, and we get to be with friends that we've come to know through years and new friends as well and old friends from across the nation. And we ride horses and we um, just get away from it all and enjoy each other's company, take take hikes and laugh a lot. One of the favorite things that we do, we did this past July, was we go up to the upper meadow and we take blankets up there and we just lay down across these blankets uh, in a row and just watch the show at night. If you've ever been in Colorado at night, out of the city, And this is up uh, Highway 7. If you've been to Estes Park, it's up towards the National uh, Forest there and National Park. And it is beautiful. And there are no lights up where we go. And it is amazing. Anybody ever been to Estes Park? You've been up that way? Or you've been to Colorado? Anybody ever actually done some, you know, stargazing in Colorado? Have you done some of that? If you have the opportunity to do that, it, it will bring a new perspective to your life. We were there and just, I mean, worship is really the word, the singular word that would describe it. We're watching shooting stars, counting them. We had one, of course, we know these are meteors who, who they come into the earth's atmosphere and as they do, friction, I think, makes them incandescent. We saw one that came through and it just burst into color as it entered into the atmosphere. And we just all oohed and awed and praised God. It's why the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. I can't understand Uh, atheists, never have been able to talk to many who don't believe in God. And I just want them to just, just go up and get a new perspective on life. As you see just how small we really are. That night, I got a new perspective again uh, that I'm pretty small. Uh, And what I do know now, what we know is that these stars are not simply little lights twinkling up on a black, you know, ceiling or something. These are giant um, masses of gas that are burning brightly, giant balls of gas that are billions and billions of miles away. Now we know in the observable universe, there are billions of stars in billions of galaxies. We have hundreds of billions of stars in the, in, in the Milky Way alone. 
And, and so as I'm looking at this and I'm thinking uh, how, how incredible God is, how big he is, it brings me to a new perspective. And it puts me in my right place. And we all need that. And that's what I want to do today. How do we get a new perspective on life? And I want you to think about as the choir and our songs have led us, our prayers have led us to consider what we're walking through in these days. We all need a new perspective. Or I I should say for many of us, a renewed back to a worldview, a perspective that allows us to walk through suffering grief and all that has come with this continued pandemic and the struggles that we see on the global stage, continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. I was listening to a pastor there uh, this week who was saying, we've just placed our fate. He said, we've placed our, our destiny in the hands of God and we're worshiping him. We will not give up. We will not stop. In fact, they were saying that they're open more and more to the gospel in the, these days. Can you imagine your country being taken over and just darkened by the evil forces that they see there, many are more open to the gospel now than ever before. We need to continue to pray for the church, the persecuted church in the world, but we need to put all of that in perspective and even think about our own struggles and, and, and suffering that we face, because it's true. Varying degrees, we're all suffering and challenged by all that we face. So how do we attain a new perspective? Being a Christian means that we have the benefit of a new perspective that others do not have. And we're going to see this in Philippians 2. So you can turn to Philippians 2, again, verses 12 through 18. And we're going to discover that there are three ways that God works in us to bring about a new perspective. This work that he does is internal, uh, it's external, and it's eternal. Because where I want us to head in the end is not simply how can we walk through grief and loss and frustration and the weight of life so often, but how can we shine like stars in the universe? And Paul tells us how this can happen. Always seeking to apply scripture. Uh, While you're finding your place there, to put this in context, Paul has been saying from the very start, he's writing to say, hey, uh, to give you an update on how I'm doing. Things aren't going as we thought they would go. I'm here in prison. You're not. I'm in prison. We're still advancing the gospel. He says that in fact, all things are working out for good. How can he say this with the backdrop of suffering, even prison and an impending death? He says, I've got a new heart. The Lord's changed my heart. I approach everything differently. I've got a new purpose. We've talked about this in recent days. Your purpose. Think about how radical this is. And we, yet we forget, what if your purpose in life is singular, to be conformed into the image of Christ? What if that is the purpose of your life? Because it is. You face everything differently. Trials that come your way, the suffering that you face, all of your losses and grief, you, you face differently because you know that God is conforming you into the image of Christ. And especially through suffering. And, and, and the backdrop of all this, actually, not just suffering, but Paul says, I, I rejoice in all that's happening. I mean, this is the most joyful book he writes from prison. And he's saying, rejoice with me. Well, how is this? Because you see, joy, joy is what's seen when others see us walk through suffering and trial because it proves that our joy is not found in our circumstances. That's how everyone else in the world lives. Instead, our joy is found in Christ, so whatever comes our way, and especially through dark and difficult days, we can shine like stars in the universe, and we live with joy, which is contrasted up against this dark backdrop. This is what we'll see today, and so then he goes on to say, hey, this has completely changed everything. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I live, it's Christ. If I die, more Christ. I can't lose. I am here for Jesus to be conformed into his image. I have a new purpose. And then then he says, hey, what does that look like? Well, Philippians 2, 1 through 11. That 3 through 11 in particular. It looks like Jesus. This is a passage we're memorizing as a church family, by the way. Make note. Memorize it together in your quiet time. Go over this passage over and over again. Philippians 2, 1 through 11. We're doing it as a staff team. We're encouraging everyone to have the same mind. Imagine, the same attitude that is ours in Christ Jesus, he says. This is what brings a new perspective. 
And so what I want to see is, is this perspective changes everything. Internal, it's external, and it's eternal. First, the internal, verse 12. Look at this. Therefore, so he's coming back, hearkening back to what I've just described, going back to let's do this together. We're conformed into the image of Christ, looks like him, a servant who's come, died on a cross for us. We're to live this same way. He's the model of life. My beloved, as you have also obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your, sal- your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who's at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, at first reading, this sounds strange, doesn't it? Work out your salvation. It seems to run counter to salvation by grace through faith alone. And, and, and so what he's saying is here, if you catch the language, he's saying, work out what's been worked in you. Work it out, meaning uh, let your life in every aspect reflect the gospel in this new life that you now have in Christ. The work he's done in you, the great exchange, on the cross, taking our sin upon himself. So it's, it's our sin for his righteousness. This work, let it be seen in everything you do. It's like uh, bread or yeast, I guess, that's kneaded into the bread. In every aspect of your life, let everyone see the work that's been done in you, the internal work, come out of you. And he says, with fear and trembling. Now this is a, a way to say, uh, with holy awe and reverence. Let the gospel penetrate and impact every aspect of your life. You know, through the years, I've had people to encourage me. I think they're seeking to be encouraging to say, Jeff, just preach the gospel, right? Just preach the gospel. And, And I think what they mean often is just tell people how to get to heaven. That's really the core message of the gospel. And yes and no. Yes, that's where we're heading. Yes, it's eternal life. It's Zoe, eternal, abundant life here and now. As if there's a, a gospel, you know, an implications free gospel. The gospel impacts all of life. Everything that we do, he says, work that out into every aspect of your life and do it with great awe and reverence before a holy God. You work it out. And, and, and because we know that, that this fear and trembling, it's really an Old Testament phrase when someone comes before God in worship. To, to come and, and lay your life, it's describing this attitude of humility because we know that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And notice he says that it's God who's at work in you. This is important for all of our unbelieving non-Christian friends to know. And friend, if you're here today and you're wondering, am I a believer? Am I not? I, 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 or maybe you're clear. I don't know yet. I want to encourage you with this. This is not, Christianity is not work harder, get better. It's not a religion. It's the work that God does in us. What Christ has already accomplished for us on the cross So we receive it by faith. Praise God, it's not by our working, but by the work he's already done. And and, and so we do the submitting, we do the dying, he does the working. And he's already done all that's necessary for you to be saved, for you to be forgiven. So what does this look like lived out? Well, Philippians 2, 1 through 11. It's why we're memorizing this passage. It's humbling ourselves, becoming a servant, even to the point of death. So this becomes a model of living. This is how we're formed into the image of Christ. It's through the crucible of suffering. It's through the crucible of dying to self. Well, how does this happen? It happens most often through trial and struggle. And again, the backdrop of all of this is persecution of the church in Philippi. Paul's very own life, he says, if you're going to have a new perspective, you must have a new philosophy, a new theology of struggle. Because this is where the rubber hits the road. It's not fun, it's hard, and yet it's forming us into the image of Christ. This is how he sanctifies us. Because we will go no other way. When I was looking up at those stars, what I couldn't see, and yet I know, is that stars are being born all the time. I don't know if you know this. It happens within nebulae. Uh, A nebula is the space, this, this gas and solar wind and heat between stars and it's in these stars they call they're the nursery for new stars to be born 
and then, then to, 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 to be nursed into life. And, and yet inside the nebula, it is violent. It is hot. It is turbulent, if you've ever watched Star Trek. If you go through a nebula, it is, it is wild. And, and, and what happens there, unlike our nurseries for our babies, that are places that are quiet and soft and gentle and, and, and secure. I've walked through our new nursery space this week. You're going to be able to walk through it, see it next week. It's going to be open for our littlest ones. It's a place of security and safety. It's quiet. That's not the nursery of our Lord. The nursery of our Lord is a place like, like, a, like a nebula. It is, it is pressure filled. It is hot, can be violent and turbulent in our lives. Your perspective on suffering has to change is what Paul says. That through that, God is making you, forming you into a light that's gonna burn brightly for him. You become a star in the universe. See, the Lord's nursery is more like a nebula. It's through struggle. But do you know how a star keeps on burning? It's a fusion. It's a, it's a nuclear fusion of hydrogen that continues just to, 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 to burst. And, and, and it's a giant explosion, in essence, over and over again. And, and it keeps the fire burning. And that fusion keeps a star from collapsing in on itself as well which become like a, a black hole. It's a nuclear fusion. And, and this is the work that God does in us. It's the Holy Spirit. Once you receive Christ, there's this fusion, a dynamic power of the Spirit in you that allows you to continue to brightly shine for him. And, and yet so often uh, we, we turn inwardly and, and Paul tells us, here's how this can happen. Look, you, you have this internal change that's taking place in you. The Spirit of God at work in you now. But what happens is if you don't work this out, you're going to collapse on yourself. Your, your light will no longer be able to be seen. So there's this internal change that takes place. But now there's this external change that seen the, the way we shine may be surprising. Watch this. Look at what he says. Verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. So how do we shine as lights? In a dark world. Okay, stop grumbling, stop disputing, stop complaining. You say, well, that sounds strange. But is it? Again, this passage of scripture more relevant than today's news post. God says, you want to live differently in the world? Stop grumbling. This is muttering. It's kind of just, you know, low grade, bad attitude all the time. Just mumbling all and muttering all the time. Everything's wrong in the world. I just can't believe what's going on. And then he said, then he moves to disputing, which is complaining out loud. Now we're going next level. Now let's just complain about everything going on. Why do we grumble and complain? It's a form of pride. Everybody else is wrong. I'm right. I'm the thing that's right in the universe. And I just, I just got to know everything else is wrong. And everything else in my life is wrong. Now you might say, well, how would I know? Ask someone. <laughs> Honestly, ask a spouse, ask a roommate, ask a friend. Am I, am I a complainer? And then if they love you enough, they might go, hmm. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. And I am too. Let's acknowledge it. Because it is the opposite of the way of Jesus. Jesus said that in Matthew 12, 34, he said, out of an overflow of the heart, the mouth will speak. Why do we complain? Why are we grumbling? It's simply an overflow of a selfish, discontented, disgruntled heart. And so we come to our friends. Hey, you need to come to church with me. Or I wish that you would come to my savior. Jesus is the answer. And, and grumble like you? Grumbling is a horrible PR strategy for the kingdom of God. And yet how many people think that Christians are just those who just kind of complain? You've heard it said, stop cursing the darkness, turn on the light. And the problem with many believers, we're just cursing the darkness. And we follow the way of the world, complaining, muttering, grumbling, 
You know, you, you know that we're called to live as sheep among wolves. Not wolves among sheep, not wolves among wolves. We see a lot of that in our day. You've never gone to, um, to a ranch or to a farm somewhere and seen a sign that says, beware of sheep. <laughs> You've never seen that. Because a sheep is just here to serve, right? A sheep is just innocent, gentle, and this is how we shine. In fact, look at verse 15. We do this so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. This word crooked is scolios. You hear the word in the Greek, scoliosis. And twisted means, um, means it means distorted. It, in other words, perverse. It, it's, it's plotting against the saving purposes of God. This crooked and twisted generation. This is an Old Testament term that's used here. Jesus used the term. So evidently we're not the first twisted, distorted, perverse generation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. You see that? This is how we shine. We, we, we shine like lights in the darkness. Like stars in the universe. This is seen several places in scripture. It always describes the people of God. Are you shining in the dark place that God's placed you? Are you just muttering and grumbling and complaining? Just, just allowing instead your light to just be, to be snuffed out. Proverbs 4, 18 through 19 says, but the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness, They do not know over what they stumble. And then the Bible tells us, even as we're persecuted, even in suffering, this is where, again, we shine the brightest. It's why believers in places like Afghanistan, maybe in your workplace, hear more and more, it seems, in America, those of us who really pursue Jesus and seek to shine his love to everyone, we will stand out more and more. In fact, in Daniel 12, 3, it says, and for those who are wise, well, it shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. I love that. You know, when we were in Colorado, we waited till about 10 o'clock to go up to the upper meadow to see the stars because you want it to be as dark as possible. The middle of the night is even better. And you see, what, what happens for us is we've got to step into dark places to shine. The Lord doesn't want us simply to come together, all of us shining brightly together, right? That's a good thing, as we'll see here in a moment. He wants us to come together, come gather together to be, to be around the light source and encourage each other. But the darker it is, the brighter we shine. How do we do that? By being the loudest? By being the best debater? By being the smartest? By being the first? No. No, we we shine as we take on the way of Jesus. Again, Philippians 2, 3 through 11, 1 through 11, that you'll be memorizing. He's the one who said, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And they could say, well, he's no longer here in bodily form, or is he? Now the church, we are called the body of Christ. We are the visible Example, picture, and light of Jesus in the world. And so we go forth to glow. And this week you'll have opportunity to do so. Some of you, maybe you've seen or have, you know, like glow in the dark toys that we give to our kids at times, or maybe you have some glow in the dark paint. You've seen that? Glow in the dark pajamas. I hope you have some glow in the dark pajamas. But, um, but I, I need to go get me some. But, but what happens there is, um, you know, the glow in the dark is, has phosphors in it. I had to look this up. But, but, it, but the closer it is to the light source, the stronger the light source, the longer it has what's called persistence. They call it pers- how long it continues to glow. And so like that, we are like the glowing in the dark. It's close proximity to the source and then coming back to the source constantly as we tend to lose our light and our glow in a dark world through complaining and through negative uh, mindset. We've got to keep coming back. It's why it's so important that we continue to worship the Lord together, why we come together. This is why Jesus said, you know, Matthew 5 
14, he said, you are the light of the world. I thought he was, he said, now you are the light. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the stand, right? And it gives light to all who are in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. Light shines in the dark. And the darker it gets, the brighter the light shines. We don't need to all hang out together. Instead, yes, let's maintain the glow. Let's be encouraged by one another. In fact, do you know what the first sign of backsliding and slipping away from the Lord. You know what the first sign of that is? A lack of attendance and regular gathering with the people of God in worship. It's the first step towards backsliding and sin and then your light goes out. We forget who we are. It's so critical that we come together. So here's the question I'd have for you. Are you a complainer or are you a contributor? How do we keep shining brightly. I'm seeing some of you who, who serve in our children's uh, ministries or in our youth ministry or you serve in some form, some way here in the church. I saw my friend Jack Davis out front welcoming all of us as we come in to the front and others of you serving in different areas of the church. This is how you keep glowing and keep shining. Are you a complainer or are you contributing? Because we continue to grow brighter and brighter as we serve him. So how do we keep on shining brightly? Look at verse 16 of Philippians 2 again. Holding fast to the word of life. This is the gospel in essence. This is the word of Christ. So that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. He's saying hold fast to the word of life. Now this is a different word. You know, in verse 6 of chapter Two, he says that Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, to be held onto, but to be released. He let go of it. That's not the same word here. This word, I think, is better translated to hold forth, to hold out. Hold out the word of life. We exemplify with our lives what we amplify with our lips. It's attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, who said, um, preach the gospel and, if necessary, use words. Well, you do a little research, you realize he didn't ever say that, nor is it really true. I mean, I get the sentiment. No, preach the gospel and when necessary, use words. And it's necessary that we use words. Because Jesus, again, an overflow of the heart comes out of the mouth. We are to, to put forth the word of life, which is the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. When we get a new perspective, it changes us internally. It changes our external lives and we shine like stars in the universe. And finally, we'll land on this. There's an eternal change, internal, external, and, 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 and uh, eternal. Paul mentions the day of Christ. Did you see that? This is the day of his coming when all things will be restored. Paul has already noted that he may die. And he may die soon, he thinks, and he does. History tells us that he is ultimately executed there in Rome. But in Christ, he says, hey, even in my dying, I'm going to glorify the Lord. So he ends with a worst case scenario. Look at verse 17. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. This is an Old Testament offering, but he's saying, I'm just poured out even unto death. I am, look at this, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul is saying, my life may end, but here's what he's saying, I love this. He says, but I'm gonna go supernova. You know what a supernova is? Supernova happens when a star dies. And what happens, the core of the star goes from thousands of miles across a star to just dozens of miles in, in a moment, in no time, and it flings outer, the outer layers of the star violently out into the universe, away from, with incredible amounts of energy. And, and, and so there's this outshining, this supernova burst out, and, it, and a supernova can be brighter than an entire galaxy for days, even weeks at a time. 
The Bible tells us that even as we die, even when this life ends, Paul says, rejoice with me. How in the world? Because he said, I'm not collapsing. I am going to become a supernova. I'm not a dark hole. I'm not, I'm not dying and then disappearing. Instead, my life, my sacrifice will fuel and instigate the growth of the church. And I see it all the time. I'm seeing Dr. Jack Martin here with us and Stephen and others of us who, who, who stand at a graveside or who enter into a funeral memorial moment. And God is receiving glory from the saints who go, who passed on, pointing everyone to eternity and to the life that they've lived and the life that they now live in him. It happened again this week. And what Paul is saying, you, we need a new perspective on death and dying and on this life. We're constantly dying. We're constantly giving ourselves over to Jesus. And in our suffering, even in our death, God is glorified. With all the words that we could use when someone passes, we talk about it's, it's tragic, it's sad, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's, it's all of those things. The one word that God uses in Psalm 115, 16, precious in the sight of the Lord, is the death of one of his saints. Why is that? Because their life has just begun. And if we proclaim the gospel through our lives, even in our death, the light of Christ goes forth. And this happens because of the cross. The cross is the supernova. The beautiful light of Christ and his righteousness, his holiness exploded. Life exploded from that hill outside of Jerusalem. So that new stars were born. You and I are reborn. We're remade because of Christ and what he has done. The supernova of Jesus has propelled us forward to give us life so that whatever comes our way, we have a new perspective. And it is internal. It is external. And it is eternal. Praise be to God for his sacrifice upon the cross. And may we never, never forget. So I want us to close our time by partaking of the Lord's Supper together. And let me just offer prayer while you grab your element there. Lord, I thank you so much for this word that you've given us today. And I ask now that you would allow us, Lord, to remember, remember what you've accomplished for us. And we give you our lives anew with a new perspective on our suffering, our challenges, and all that we face in this life. And we die to ourselves to live for you. And I pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.